whenever the topic of slave trade comes up. What comes to our minds are the images of black slaves in shackles and chains aboard a ship bound for the Caribbean and other parts of Europe. This was called the transatlantic slave trade. But that is not what we are talking about today. In this episode, we take a look at the enslavement that was responsible for over 20 million Africans across the Sahara to Egypt, Syria and other parts of the Middle East. The Trans-Sahara Slave Trade Before we start, please like and subscribe to our channel for more stories, otherwise we will not share our sweet palm wine with you. You might be wondering, aren't the Europeans the one who arrived to the shores of Africa and took loads of slaves away on their ships, loads? Hmm, okay, let me explain. There were two major forms of slave trades in Africa. The first was the Trans-Sahara slave trade. The second is the Transatlantic or the Triangular slave trade. The Trans-Sahara slave trade is by far the oldest type of slave trade documented in Africa and perhaps the world at large. It dates as far back as 1000 BCE. Although the desert was so large that it was referred to as the Sea of Sands by early Roman and Jewish historians, trade roads were already established. A large number of items from foodstuff, gold and salt, which originated from the rich salt mines of North Africa, were carried along these routes, and every trade had its own dawn. The Arabs <laughs> The Arab merchants conducted their business between North African states in the West. In return, they brought in weapons fabrics and other precious items to sell to the North Africans, even down towards the West. West Africans, how far? The lucrative business meant prosperity for everyone, which led to the need for cheaper manpower that will later be found in slaves. Ooh. The continuous movement of slaves across the Sahara came to be known as the Trans-Sahara Slave Trade and this was later to be monopolized for hundreds of years, even up to the 19th century. The spread of Islam in West Africa, especially in areas close to the Sahara, bridged the communication gap between traders of African and Arab origin and fostered more trade across the desert. While it was estimated that the transatlantic slave trade which occurred in the later years led to the forced exodus of over 18 million Africans, the exact number of Africans traded across the Sahara is unknown. Hmm. Contemporary historians believe that this was an estimate of over 27 million Africans. The journey across the Sahara, which is the natural demarcation between North and West Africa, was about 1,200 miles, which by any means is not an easy feat. But the introduction of desert limos, <laughs> sorry, camels, reduced the distance, but not for the slaves. They endured the scorching sun, the cold nights, sandy walkways, and sandstorms, which gave no warnings the poisonous reptiles. Oh God! The slaves often go for days without food and water. Oh, please, give me water to drink. Dehydration killed more slaves than their slave masters did. Sick and feeble ones would be left behind to die and rebellious ones would be killed. The women either became sex slaves or concubines and some of the men were trained as soldiers. Whatever the case, they all had a common destiny to be sold as slaves to the highest bidder once the desert has been crossed. The Trans-Sahara slave trade was also harsh to the merchants too. If one ever embarked on such a journey, he would have to travel with his entire family or army or still kiss them goodbye because he could not predict when he would return. <laughs> Masheri. I may never see you again. In those days, 
It might take six months or one year to travel and return through the desert. That is, if you do not meet with the gentlemen of the desert. And talking, Ali Baba and the 40 thieves, more the 40 thieves than Ali Baba himself. Today, such journeys take only about two to three hours to cross the desert by air. Whenever you see the inventors of the aircraft, just thank them. As the trade continued deep into West Africa, weaker states were raided. The slaves will work in gold mines and carried it off for long distances. Stronger states imposed taxes when the merchants passed through their territories and the merchants formed alliances with kings for protection of trade. Those smart devils. These led to the rise of powerful kingdoms who had gold, had slaves, but had stupid kings who exchanged slaves for a bottle of whiskey, which even threatened the sale of our sweet Pam wine. Bad king, bad, bad king. One powerful kingdom that we need to know in those times, 1324, was the Mali Empire, where the richest man who ever lived ruled. Yeah, you can verify that on Forbes. His name was Mansa Musa, the 10th Mansa, or Emperor of Mali. Hail the Mansa! Now in case you didn't know, Mansa Musa had a brother named Mansa Abubakar. Before he became king, Mali Empire extended up to the current day Ghana, Guinea, Senegal, Mauritania, and Gambia. Some historians say it also consisted of the Kano Empire in modern day Nigeria. The king before him has reportedly reached the fifth stage of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and wanted more. So he handed Musa the kingdom and went on an expedition to explore the Atlantic Ocean but never returned. Mansa Musa took over the kingdom, expanded it through a series of conquests of weaker and rebellious states. At the height of its power, Mali had over 400 cities, had universities with Arabian scholars and architects. Ooh, yeah. Mansa Musa was a good politician and knew his game. He was so rich in gold that on his pilgrimage to Mecca, he went with 60,000 men, all wearing expensive Persian silks and brocades. 12,000 slaves, did I say slaves? Yes, slaves that helped to carry luggage of gold across the Sahara with him. 80 camels, all loaded with gold dust and he fed his entire company all through the journey. It was said that he built a mosque each Friday, gave gifts of gold to the poor and spent extensively. Ooh, he's a spender. Some historians believed he deliberately wanted to devalue the Egyptian gold market since the amount of good he splashed particularly in Cairo created financial recession for the next 10 years. This is the only time recorded in history that one man directly controlled the price of gold in the Mediterranean. Others say it was a show-off to make his Timbuktu the capital of Mali famous. Indeed, Mansa Musa made Timbuktu so famous such that the news of his wealth and pilgrimage to the Holy Land caught the attention of Europeans as Mali found her way into the Catalan Atlas in 1375. In fact, the major African city recognized by most Europeans around the 14th century was Timbuktu. Just tell her yeah. I went to Timbuktu, tell her I'm searching for gold. Many European explorers sailed through the Atlantic Ocean from France, Portugal, England, Germany and Spain to see for themselves what was in Africa and a number of them landed in the West African ports. These events led to the realization of the vast wealth of Africa by the Europeans, which later gave birth to the transatlantic slave trade and later the colonization of Africa. Oh, sad. We, the native historians, recognize the legends of early European explorers, the agony of transatlantic slave trade and its abolition, the Harlem shipwreck and African myths that favored colonization. Stay with us as we explore these four-part episodes in our next season called The Merchants of the Ocean. We welcome your comments and contributions and don't forget to support us by subscribing, liking and sharing our video and we shall be sharing our sweet palm wine 
with you all the way. <laughs>